I'm Dr. David H. Adamkin, and it is my pleasure to talk about protein in nutritional strategies in preterm infants. Here are my disclosures. Let's begin with some recommendations from the SBM Committee on Nutrition Advisable Intakes for Stable Growing Preterms through 1800 grams. Protein 3.5 to 4.5 grams per kilogram per day, and energy 110 to 135 calories per kilogram per day. This is a study that was recently uh, published by Dr. Fenton, and it is a literature search looking for papers that one can relate protein intake and growth and health outcomes. 25,000 articles reviewed and two older trials, one from 1991 from Bhatia and one from Hillman in 1994, were the only ones that met criteria to answer these questions. Let's quickly look at what these papers show. First, protein intake greater than 3.3 grams per kilogram per day produced a significant difference in weight gain versus preterm formulas with lower intakes. Protein greater than three grams per kilogram per day versus a lower dose of protein produced an improved weight gain of 2.4 grams per kilogram per day. Protein dose of greater than 3.5 grams per kilogram per day versus a lower protein dose. Mean difference in weight was 2.6 grams per kilogram per day. So not a real robust difference between 3 or 3.5 grams per kilogram per day versus a lower dose. Comparing protein intake down to 2.6 versus 3.1, no evidence of effect on length, head circumference, skin fold, mid-arm, circumference, some improvement in development with a higher protein, 3.8 versus 3.1 versus 2.6 grams per kilogram per day were used. And you can see the degree of certainty from the papers with a couple of the results having low certainty. And no studies were identified that compared enteral protein intakes greater than four versus less protein. So we really have a modest amount of data Uh, for the higher protein doses that we use today. Conclusion was in this systematic review, found that protein intake of 3.5 to 4 grams per kilogram per day promotes weight gain, improves neurodevelopment compared to less than 3.5. These did not include human milk-fed babies, so applying the results to human milk-fed babies is questioned. This is really a formula study. This is a very nice uh, paper uh, published uh, just this year, which gives you a very nice summary of how to implement findings from nutritional intervention studies into your daily clinical practice and provides the different formulas and strategies to do so. So let's look at what they found. High supplies of protein and energy during the first weeks of life, i.e., PE greater than 3 and energy greater than 100 calories per kilogram per day improve both early growth and later neurodevelopmental outcome. Next, discontinuation of this high energy diet is advised beyond 32 to 34 weeks post conceptual age to prevent excess fat mass and possible later cardiometabolic diseases. And then after discharge, nutrition with a higher protein to energy ratio, greater than 2.5 to 3 grams of protein per 100 calories, which is a protein energy ratio, may improve growth and body composition in the short term. So they conclude, preterm infants' first weeks of life require a high protein energy diet starting shortly after birth, and then subsequent adjustments in nutritional composition, which are aimed at optimizing body composition and minimizing long-term cardiometabolic risks, but not jeopardizing the developed brain. How do you do that? Guided by growth 
pattern. So that's a very important statement of all the things combined that we're trying to do with uh, infant nutrition for premature babies in regards particularly to protein. So let's talk about protein formulas. So preterm formulas reaching four grams per kilogram per day. Why four grams per kilogram per day? Because that's the fetal protein growth requirement, the Ziegler reference fetus. We have two types of preterm formulas, if you will, a standard protein and a high protein. You'll see, however, one, one company's standard preterm formula, PE ratio, equals another company's high protein PE ratio. So that's grams of protein per 100 calories, PE ratio. So when we feed babies at 120 calories, per kilogram per day, which is 150 cc's per kilogram per day. With these two standard formulas, we can reach 3.6 or 4 grams per kilogram per day. Again, the goal being at least 4 to match fetal growth, perhaps more if we want to catch up. With the high-protein preterm formulas, we again can reach 4 or out to 4.3 grams per kilogram per day. However, we can increase protein very simply by increasing calories, which means increasing volume. And that example is shown in the lowest box, 132 calories. Uh, and what protein do you reach at 165 cc's per kilogram per day? With the standards, 4.1 and 4.5. And with the high proteins, 4.5. And almost five. I mean, LSRO recommends not exceeding five. So this gives you a feel for the two types of protein formulas, standard and high. And we tend to advise using the high protein preterm formula for these very low birth weight babies. This study actually shows what happens at the bedside with a high protein preterm formula. We're going to feed one that's a 3.6 PE ratio versus a standard. And we're going to look at nitrogen absorption and nitrogen retention. And we see, as you'd expect, that nitrogen absorption and nitrogen retention are greater with the blue the high protein preterm formula. The intake now in the box to the right is 4.6 grams per kilogram per day. If we look at the growth requirement based on nitrogen retention, it's 2.5 grams per kilogram per day. These babies actually accreted 3.2 grams per kilogram per day, which means that there was 0.75 grams per kilogram per day available for catch-up growth. So that's a very good thing and shows the value of an increased protein intake. The next issue in protein formulas is what I call caloric dense feedings. And these are feedings that provide uh, greater than 24 calories per ounce. These are feedings for infants who cannot meet their needs for growth with a standard preterm formula or a standard fortified human breast milk. At the end of the day, what we're really interested in is proportional growth more than absolute weight gain. Again, protein is most important. Looking at this table, we show four caloric dense feedings, a 27 cal, two 30 cals, and a old time 30 cal, which I'll discuss in a moment. So what's the virtue here? You're looking at the PE ratio of these caloric denses, and the caloric dense range from three PE ratio out to 3.3. P.E. ratio. That means that's the amount of protein you get in 100 calories. Well, 100 calories would be 111 cc's of the 27 cal and would be about 100 cc's of the 30 cal, which would be a very restricted fluid uh, baby at 100 cc's per kilo per day would still receive three or 3.3 grams per kilogram per day of protein. If we feed it a little more generously, at say 120 calories per kilogram per day, which would still limit the volume, you could reach a protein of four and almost four with the two 30 cals. What is that last 30 cal 
that is a combination of a 24 cal formula, polycos and MCT oil. That's the way we used to jerry rig a 30 cal before we had ready to feeds. And you can see it really wasn't very good. We had a PE ratio of 2.2. And if that is fed at 120 calories per kilogram per day, the baby would receive 2.6 grams per kilogram per day of protein with a lot of energy. So that's a baby that would grow in width, but you wouldn't be accreting lean body mass. So these caloric denses have been wonderful for babies with BPD and fluid restriction to get them to grow with proportionality. Let's go to human milk. The AAP in 2012 statement on breastfeeding, potent benefits, which we're all aware of. Mother's own milk, fresh or frozen, should be the primary diet and fortified in quotations, as we'll see in a few minutes, easier said than done. But the, uh, the news on this one was that if mother's milk is unavailable, despite significant lactation support, pasteurized donor milk should be used. So that led to the emergence of a lot of uh, human milk banks and also uh, donor milk from the private sector. So let me show you a study that shows the two main issues we're dealing with, with the use of human milk for very low birth weight babies. This is a retrospective study we did from our nursery uh, of babies less than 1,500 grams. And I'm showing you two groups. One group is no human milk, and that was about 14% of our babies in the study. And then another group that received almost exclusive human milk, and that was another 13%. So about one fourth of the babies were either in a no human milk situation or exclusive human milk with the other 75% re receiving both formula and human milk during their stay. What we're looking at here is growth. And very quickly, if you look at what's inside the red uh, box, highlighted box, is that weight, Z-score, and head circumference, Z-score are much more negative in the babies receiving human milk. So minus 1.38 for the uh, human milk fed babies for weight Z-score versus negative 0.84 with formula and head circumference 0.74 negative with human milk versus 0.25 with formula, and those are going to plot out very differently and put you in potential postnatal growth failure territory. Now, the next slide shows you the same two groups. This time, we're looking at mortality rate and NEC, and the mortality rate's 8%. In the formula group, zero, with the human milk fed NEC, 10.5% versus none. Of course, no surgical with human milk, 8% surgical rate with the no human milk. And this is just the difference between 53 days of human milk versus none. So the conundrum is we want to prevent NEC. That's why we are so enthusiastic about the short-term benefits of human milk. But we also recognize that postnatal growth failure, which is depicted on the graph from the NICHD study in the 90s, shows us that postnatal growth failure, where babies are discharged below the 10th percentile, is a surrogate for inadequate nutrition and may increase the risk of neurodevelopmental impairment if it continues. So how do we fix that? Well, we've got to ask the question, does human milk meet the nutritional requirements of the very low birth weight infant? And let's look at the answer to that question. Here we're looking at the protein intake for a baby receiving its own mother's milk, assumed to have 1.4 grams per deciliter. One, so it would be 2.5 at full feeds. Remember that four grams per kilogram per day is our goal with the reference fetus to match in utero growth. Term human milk is worse, assuming it has, and it does have 0.9 grams per deciliter. Full feeds would be 1.5 grams per kilogram per day, and there is your four grams per kilogram per day to match the fetus. So we definitely have a protein problem in getting these babies to grow. So let's look at this problem, if you will, and the challenges of 
fortification. On this slide, you're looking at the orange curve is a very low birth weight baby receiving its own mother's milk, and we are plotting protein content, grams per deciliter, versus weeks of lactation. And you see that the highest protein is the colostral milk early on, and then the protein begins to fall over the next two to three months. And in the two blue arrows, you see the window of fortification somewhere a little bit before two weeks and out to two to three months, depending on how immature the baby, how long it would be fortified. The broken line is the donor milk, which remember has 0.9 grams per deciliter and is even more of a challenge to uh, reach protein requirements. So the protein is falling during the entire period that you are trying to fortify that baby with whatever product you're using, which you're going to use the same amount every day. And for the industry to tell you what you're going to get when you use their product, what the protein is going to be of the milk after you add the product, they have to assume a protein content of the milk that they're fortifying. And the assumption is that the milk they're fortifying has 1.5 grams per deciliter. And certainly it may sometimes, but many times it may be significantly less. And that's the challenge of meeting that recommended intake of 3.5 to 4.4 grams per kilogram per day that we talked about during the first slide, the recommendation for protein and energy for growth. So these are the products that are available for fortifying human milk, and we'll just focus on the protein again, which is highlighted. Preterm human milk with no fortification, about 2.1 grams per kilogram per day at 150, this time assuming about 1.4 grams per deciliter. Uh, the second is the HM square, that's the human milk fortifier, which is derived from concentrating donor human milk. So it's an exclusive human milk diet in the, including the fortifier being a human milk. And you see that the protein comes up to around 3.5, doesn't meet the four grams per kilogram per day. And then three uh, products that are the new concentrated liquid sterile bovine fortifiers get you to four and above grams per kilogram per day. And then the old powders, which we don't use anymore because you can't guarantee their sterility, they're not sterile, uh, would be a low protein anyway. This slide shows same exact thing for donor milk and how much more challenging it is. Donor milk alone, 1.4, assuming 0.9 grams per deciliter for its protein content. And then uh, you see that the proteins are more modest for all the products, more modest for the uh, HM2 and the powder, but still uh, below four with the uh, concentrated liquid. So more challenging to meet requirements with the donor milk. Again, assuming that the milk had 1.4 grams per deciliter when you're fortifying preterm milk and assuming it has 0.9 grams per deciliter when you're fortifying donor milk, which is shown on this slide. So key messages, finished protein requirements are dynamic and decrease with advancing gestational age and weight. PE ratio is important to determine proportionality of growth. For infants where there is no human milk available, higher protein containing preterm formula should be used. Use of sterile liquid, higher protein containing fortifiers should be used to initially fortify mother's milk or donor milk when feeding very low birth weight infants. And finally, caloric dense formulas or caloric dense human milk strategies can be used to reach adequate protein intake in fluid restricted infants. Here's a list of the uh, references used in the uh, slides. There are also reference on the slides. This video was provided to you by Aspen and supported by an educational grant from Reckitt Mead Johnson. This five-part video series on the nutrition requirements and feeding issues for the preterm infant will be available on the Aspen website at nutritioncare.org 
forward slash neonatal care resources.